All right, here we go. On Christ the solid rock we stand, right? Build everything on there, and we'll be on firm ground, don't you think? You bet we will. Hey, you know, one of the main differences between a person who is a Christian and one who is not is how we relate to other people. Or at least it should be one of the main differences, that's for sure. And today, we're going to pick up actually where we left off two weeks ago. Remember, I kind of jumped ahead one verse, and we had, had endure or really live life, you know, and then we went back last week to the verse right before that. And so we're kind of picking up uh, right now. And if you remember, I mentioned that Romans is divided into two parts. And the first, it, the 11 chapters, they deal with doctrinal issues. In fact, Romans is a really heavy book when it comes to doctrinal things, Okay. And what we, it's about what we believe and who we are in Christ. And quite fl- frankly, like I said, they're very important for us. But beginning in chapter 12 through the end of the book of Romans, it's very practical. That is, instead of doctrine, it's duty. Instead of, of what we believe, it's how we're to behave. And instead of who we are in Jesus, it is what we do because we are in Jesus. We belong to him. So let's take a look at our passage for today. It's found in Romans 12, verses 14 to 16. It says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep or mourn with those who mourn or weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty or proud, but be willing to associate with the lowly people of low position. Never be wise in your own sight, or in other words, do not be conceited. You know, sometimes people say that the Bible is not very practical. Well, I don't agree, because there's a lot of principles in the Bible that are very practical, and they hit us right where we are. And today, I'd really like to talk with you about five healthy relationship practices. These are things we should practice. And when I say practice, it's not like I'm talking about the Ten Commandments. I'm talking about practices or principles like the law of gravity. If you do one thing... Something's going to happen. And in relating to other people, if you practice these principles, you will get along with other folks and you will have healthy relationships in your home and in your workplace and in your community community, and in the church. Now, what is it that makes you different as a Christian than somebody that's not a Christian? The fact that when you die, you're going to heaven? Well, yeah, but practically speaking, it ought to mean a whole lot more than that, don't you think? As I mentioned earlier, one of the main differences between a Christian and one who isn't should be how we relate or treat other people, and in particular, other people who don't like us, and especially those people who mistreat us. But isn't it just those very people who make this so hard, right? Those who don't like us or mistreat us. Otherwise, usually we'd probably be fine, right? Well, those of you who are older than me, or at least as old as I am, or like history, may remember Nikita Khrushchev. In the 1960s, he was sort of a spokesman for the communist world, if you'll remember. And when he came to America, he made this statement. The difference between Christianity and communism is great. (laughs) Yeah, duh, right? But he goes on. When someone hits you, you turn the other cheek. He meant us as Christians. But Khrushchev said, if you hit me, I'll hit you so hard your head will fall off. Now, that was kind of his mentality, all right? That's the communist mentality. Now, today, communism is just a little bit more subtle than that, or perhaps more disguised about their ultimate goals or their creed. But my guess is that they're still their ideas and their ideals, even if they don't state it quite that bluntly. But if we're honest we are so, with ourselves, isn't that, isn't, isn't that kind of their, their attitude? It's the same attitude as, as that of natural man. Think about it. You hit me, brother, and you're going to get it back. Look and see what the Bible says about how we ought to relate to people. Look again with me again at our verses. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep or mourn with those who weep or mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty or proud, but be willing to associate with people who of the lowly or people of low position. And never be wise in your own sight and don't be conceited. Now, We're going to take a look at those five healthy relationship principles that we see here. And the first practice is the practice of adversity. Well, I don't need to practice that. It's everywhere, right? Well, we're going to practice it. You're saying, really? Romans 12, 4. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Hmm. How do you relate to someone when you're in an adversarial relationship? When they're hostile toward you? This practice could be summarized this way. Be a blessing to those who hurt you. Now, friends... That doesn't come naturally, does it? And I'm not sure many Christians have it down or manage it always. Yes, there are people who are going to hurt you. There are going to be people who treat you mean. 
There are going to be people who treat with anger or hostility. And the Bible says, and I'm sorry, I can't change it or soften it for you or for me, you're to bless them. You're to bring blessings to them. Yes, maybe even especially them. A little girl wrote this letter to her pastor. Dear pastor, I heard you say to love your enemies. I am only six and I don't have any yet, but I hope to have some when I'm seven. Your friend, Amy. Now, chances are, if you've lived any length of time, a little longer than Amy, that you have a few enemies. Well, maybe you wouldn't call them enemies. Maybe they're just folks that aren't your biggest fan, you know, those that don't like you. For whatever reason, maybe some, like something really important, like your haircut. Now, they can't tell if I have one or not, but maybe that's it. And really, if you don't have any, in a way, something could be a little wrong because there's always going to be people who don't care for the way you act or how you live or what you live for or what you believe. And in fact, this is sort of a preview for a Sunday message a couple of weeks from now because next Sunday we're celebrating, but the Sunday after that, we're going to pick up with verse 17 through the rest of the chapter, and it really talks about how to kill your enemies. And everybody's out there saying, what? Well, I didn't finish the sentence. How you kill your enemies with love, Okay. It's entitled, How to Deal with Mean People. So we're all going to be back, right? Because we probably all know somebody like that. And you know, I thought about softening that title too. But when you read the rest of the, top, rest of the chapter, I really think that that title is actually appropriate. So if you ever have to deal with mean people, the Bible tells us how to relate to them, and you won't want to miss that Sunday, okay? Now basically, verse 14 is telling us that when people hurt you, you're to bless them. And notice there's a negative command and a positive command. And negative, negative is, don't curse them. But isn't it human nature that when someone hurts you or mistreats you, the first thing you want to do is just go cuss them out or curse them out? In a way, you know, verbally hurting them right back. That is, if you weren't a Christ follower, of course, because we don't curse, okay? Isn't that what would come more naturally? You know, sometimes people wonder what the Bible says about cursing. And here's exactly what it says. It says, do not curse people. Okay? It's pretty clear. Do not curse people. Why? Well, you see, God is the only one who has the right and the authority to send somebody to hell. And yet we hear people sending others there pretty frequently anymore, don't we? But you and I have no business telling anybody that that's where they're going to end up. The Bible says you should not curse anybody. Instead, it says, it says you should bless them. Let them tell you what, let, let me tell you what the word bless means. Are you ready for this? It is the word eulogia, eulogia, and it means good word, and if it sounds a little bit familiar to you, it should. It means you're to speak a good word even to those who hurt you, and our English word eulogy comes from the word bless. It means more than just saying God bless you when they sneeze. It means you say something good about them even when they said something ugly about you, and remember this, didn't your mom always tell you, are you ready? Rehearse it with me. If you can't say something good about somebody, don't say anything at all. That wasn't very nice because my mother said it a whole lot nicer to me than I just said it. Okay? But that's true. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. You know, a lady in the church was noted to be so kind and positive all the time. And, and since she's not here, I'm going to tell you who, who this reminds me of. This reminds me of Judy, who sits down here right beside Ron. Okay, so nice and so positive all the time. But anyway, this lady, one of her friends said, Betty, you say such nice things about everybody. I bet you could even find something good to say about the old devil. And she thought for a minute and she said, well, now that you mention it, I think you'll agree. He's always on the job. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Well, we need to make this our practice. That's how we ought to be. We ought to find something good to say about someone, even mean, trying, you know, somebody who's trying, somebody who's frustrating or wearying. They wear us out. That's what the word bless means, to say something good about them. Is it challenging? You bet it is. It's very challenging. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute. I remember the Old Testament. And didn't it teach something called equal retribution or equal retaliation? You remember what the Old Testament says, right? It says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, once you think about it, doesn't that kind of seem fair? I mean, really? And for the time, it was an advanced moral standard. Because you know what human nature is? Human nature is not an eye for an eye. Human nature is, Sam, if you poke out mine, I'm going to take out both of yours. That's the way it goes. And Sam, if you knock one of my teeth out, yours are all gone. Okay? That's human nature. And that's how things escalate and ping pong back and forth and, and ramp completely out of control, ever upping the ante. 
So the Old Testament came along and said, no, there's a higher standard. Only an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Then Jesus came along, <laughs> and he changed everything. He sets an even higher standard. And his teaching was totally revolutionary. Look at Luke 6, 27 to 28. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat or abuse you. Jesus is saying, you know, I want to change how things have been. I have a higher calling. I have a better way. I'm going to up the ante, and I'm going to do it my way. Check out those verbs. Is there anybody who's your enemy? Love them. Is there anybody who hates you? Do good for them. Is there anybody that's been cursing you? (laughs) You're to bless them. Has anybody mistreated or abused you? Pray for them. And then Jesus makes the summary statement in verses 32 and 36. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Human nature says, I'm going to pay you back with interest. What you did to me, I'm going to get even and do more. Jesus comes along and says, no, (laughs) no, no, no. It's not even equal retribution. It's not retaliation. It's blessing them instead of hurting them. And that's the practice of adversity. And then we move on to practice number two, the practice of empathy. We're to practice this according to Romans uh, 12.5. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep or mourn with those who weep or mourn. So how might we summarize this? Well, it's being sensitive to the feelings of others. And if you practice this principle, you'll always be sensitive to the emotions and the feelings of others. Now, do you know the difference between sympathy and empathy? Sympathy is feeling sorry for somebody else. Empathy is feeling sorry with somebody else. There's a very difference, and Kim says, I'm very sorry. But anyway... Now, this passage provides two extremes. Rejoice with those who rejoice and cry or mourn with those crying or mourning. Now, you may think, I mean, it seems like it would be easier to rejoice with people when they're rejoicing, right? Because the model of the world is this. Laugh and the whole world laughs with you, and, but cry, and you cry alone. But I think for just, let's think for just a moment. Sometimes it's harder to rejoice with those who rejoice. Say there's a person who's rejoicing because something good has happened to them. Human human nature can say, I'm not going to rejoice with you. I'm going to resent you. I'm going to be envious of you. I'm going to be jealous of you because you had something good happen to you and I didn't. Have you ever felt just a little like that? I deserve it just as much as you. And sometimes... It's hard to rejoice over someone else's victories and accomplishments, particularly if they have a lot of them and you don't have many or you don't feel like you have any. But the Bible says we're to do that. You find somebody that's got a reason to be happy. Maybe you're not feeling real good that day or you've had a recent setback or some hard news. Don't impose or at least try not to impose your poor feelings on them. Instead, adjust your mood to them saying, wow, I'm going to rejoice with you. I'm going to be happy with you because something good has happened. Celebrate with them. On the other side of the coin, you weep with those who weep. What that means is is that when you find somebody who's really hurting, and maybe you're feeling great, you don't expect them to adjust their mood to you, okay? True love says, no, I'm going to adjust my mood to you. I'm going to be sensitive to your needs. And these are generally true, but we need to make an exclusion here because you and I both know that there are some folks that are just, (laughs) they're unhappy all the time, right? They are chronic moaners, complainers, groaners, sad sacks, and they're just unhappy about anything and everything. And so the Bible isn't telling us that we need to identify with them. It doesn't mean that you become like that when, when you're around them. We're talking, biblically, we're talking about people who have real reasons to mourn and who have real reasons to feel hurt, pain, and sorrow. And those are the kind of people you need to relate to. And as Christians, we need to make it our practice to mourn with those who mourn. Be a friend and brother, sister in Christ, and weep with those who weep. We'll go through times in life when there are tears that we shed. I don't think anyone is exempt. There's a passage of Scripture that's a beautiful principle about tears. It's in Psalms, Psalms 56, 8. It says, you have kept count of my tossings. Other versions render it wanderings, miseries, or sorrows. You have put or collected all my tears in your bottle. Are they not, you have recorded each one in your book. So our tears are written down in his book. 
He keeps track of them and collects them in a bottle for each person, almost like he cherishes those tears and those moments. They matter. They're important. They're valued. They're not forgotten. Now, supposedly, I don't know if you know this or not. This is something that I found out when I was doing research for this. Supposedly, as late as the Civil War, wives and mothers who were back home would take little bottles called tear vials. And they would literally capture the tears that they wept for their sons and husbands who were fighting in the battle. And they would seal up, they would seal up those tear vials and then send them to the soldiers. Now, today, Civil War buffs actually collect these tear vials. And the soldiers would put them in their pockets, and they would bring them out and look at them and how much they would cherish and value the tears that this loved one had cried for them. Isn't that interesting? I'd never heard that before. But anyway, it would seem that according to this passage of Scripture, like God has a tear vial in heaven for each and every one of us. I wonder if they have different labels on them, like you've got five or six different ones. Because like we were talking in Sunday school class today, or Christian education, you know, there are tears of joy, there are tears of sorrow, there are tears of grief, there's tears of empathy and just flat out tears of strong emotion. You know, there's different kind of tears. But anyway, I kind of wonder about that. But those of you that have wept rivers of tears because of pain and heartache in your life, know that those tears haven't been wasted. Those tears haven't been lost. They're precious to God because he understands they're the result of sorrows and broken hearts. And this passage is saying that when you love somebody, you relate to somebody and they're hurting, they're crying, you ought to cry with them. You ought to share their load. Do you know in the temple of Jerusalem during the time of Jesus, they had an interesting custom. The temple was usually crowded with people, so they made everybody walk in one door and out the other. Okay? And in Herod's temple, the worshipers would all enter the temple mount from the south and go up the steps of Solomon's portico. And then they would tend to their business with God on the Temple Mount, and then they would exit usually at the northeast corner. There was one exception to that rule. Whenever a Jewish family in Jerusalem had gone through a genuine time of heartache and sorrow, that family was allowed to walk against the flow of people traffic. They would enter where everybody else was exiting, and they would exit where everybody else was entering. Now, why do you think they did that? They did that so that the worshipers were forced to confront the faces of people who were hurting so they wouldn't dismiss their pain. Amazing. In a way, and, and not exactly, but in a way, that kind of reminds me uh, of a receiving line at a funeral or a memorial service, you know, when we do our visitations. It kind of reminds me of that. You know, I wonder, how many times have you come to the Eden Church and not really looked into the eyes and the faces of the people around you in your CE class or in the worship celebration or as you pass them in the hall or as you sit right next to them? You just sort of pass them by, and, and sometimes they you, and you're not aware of their pain or heartache, the heartache that they could be suffering. And the Bible says we're to weep with them. That's what a true friend and family member does. A woman in Charleston, South Carolina, Derek knows where that is, went to console his grandmother because one of her contemporaries had just died. And the granddaughter said to her grandmother, I know you're going to miss your friend. Grandma said, well, yeah, I miss her, but she wasn't really my friend. You know, taken back, the granddaughter said, what? I know you, the two of you spent time together. You laughed together. You talked. And then the grandmother said something very wise about relationships. She said, well, yes, we talked together and we laughed together, but we were only acquaintances because we never cried together. A true friend always shares tears. You may have a lot of acquaintances, but you're blessed indeed if you have a friend with whom you can share tears. That's what the Bible says to do. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be sensitive to the feelings of others. That's the practice of empathy. When celebrating, Jesus celebrated. When weeping, he wept. When there was weeping, he wept. Jesus went to the wedding feast at Cana. That's where his first miracle turned water into wine, where they were rejoicing and celebrating. He rejoiced because they rejoiced. And the last recorded miracle Jesus performed was in raising Lazarus. Here's, he's at the tomb of Lazarus. He looks at Martha and Mary, and what are they doing? They're crying. And what does Jesus do? <laughs> the Bible says Jesus wept. That's the kind of Savior we have. He rejoices with those who are rejoicing and weeps with those who weep. The third practice we see is the practice of harmony. For healthy relationships, that's a practice we need to have. And Romans 12, 16 says, live in harmony with one another. It's right there, very clear. But we could, we could summarize this by saying, be willing to sacrifice your need to always be right. 
Let me ask you a question, but you can keep the answer to yourself. Do you know anyone who just has to be right all the time? Anybody? They can never be wrong. They're right all the time. And my next question is this. Do you think anybody thought about you when I just asked that question? And get this. I can almost guarantee, I can't guarantee it totally, but almost guarantee that no one thought of themselves. That's the way I am. That's right. I've always got to be right. Well, the Bible says a good relational practice is if you try to live in harmony with all different kinds of people. And we have a very special guest, not a guest, but a very special family member here. We have uh, Lauren Fuseler is going to help me out with this little illustration. She's going to go to the piano, and she's going to play middle C for me. When you go to the piano, you always find middle C, right? Why? So you can orient yourself, okay? There it is. That's middle C. And once you find middle C, you can find the other notes. And to live in harmony doesn't mean you have to play the exact same notes. So sometimes we hear octaves. Beautiful, right? Sounds great. Doesn't mean you have to totally agree with that person, but it does mean that your attitude and your belief in your mind is in harmony with that person just like this. Can we hear a chord? See how rich that sounds when we hear chords? You see, they're not the same note, but it's a beautiful chord, and that's what it means to live in harmony with others. Now, there may be minor disagreements, but that's okay. That's not a major problem. But here's the problem. We have middle C. There it is. There are people, and then there are people that are never wrong, and they say, this is the way I'm going to act, and this is what I'm going to believe, and there's nothing you're going to do about it. Let's hear it, Lauren. Yeah. Chaos. A real train wreck. Right? Well, that's how we are as people. You can hear, thank you, Lauren, by the way. A nice round of applause for, for my very esteemed helper. You can hear the disharmony, right? You recognize it right away as what? That's not beautiful. That's certainly not harmony. Well, when God says we're to live in harmony with each other, when we do that, there's all kinds of beautiful music. And you say, okay, I hear, literally hear what you're saying. So, pastor, are you saying I'm middle C? No. Everybody, you know, like everybody ought to harmonize with me. No, you're not middle C. Oh, so you're saying the other person's middle C when I'm in harmony with them? No. No, that's not it. I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you that Jesus, Jesus is middle C. When I'm in harmony with Jesus, and you're in harmony with Jesus, we're in harmony together with each other and Jesus. That's what it means to live in harmony with each other. It doesn't mean that you're a clone of them. It means that your desire is to make beautiful music with them in Christ Jesus. Okay? Now listen, harmony in marriage, harmony in family, harmony in church is a very precious and quite valuable thing. That's why I want to remind us again that it is the role of our adversary, the devil, to divide and disrupt every marriage, to divide and disrupt every parent and child relationship, to divide and disrupt children against children, to divide and disrupt every church. And if you're not on your guard, the devil will drive a wedge between you and your spouse, between you and your children, between your children, between child and child, and your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why the Bible says we have to be proactive. We have to sometimes sacrifice our desire to be right so that we can live in harmony with those folks that are around us. And when it comes to sacrificing, don't you think Jesus is the expert? I mean, seriously, he gave his all. Author Jack London wrote about an event that took place in the far north when he was a, where there was a herd of reindeer. Now, don't, don't be too worried, kids. They, they survive. It's not like Santa's reindeer by the farm. But here goes. The herd was suddenly attacked by a pack of wolves. And to begin with, the, the reindeer were very disorganized, and they began to kick and lash out at these wolves. But because they were so unorganized, they were kicking each other sometimes, and sometimes the young ones, the younger reindeer. And finally, almost by instinctive nature, they got together, and the reindeer put their heads together in a circle with their hind legs facing out and put the younger and weaker animals in the center of the circle. Okay, And their legs are turned outward. And they were kicking out, and defending themselves from the wolves, and the wolves soon left. Now, what lesson can we take from this? The lesson is this, that when we get our heads together, when we get our hearts collectively together in our marriages, in our families, in the churches, we live in harmony with one another, we can repel 
and attack the ad- anything the adversary throws at us. Okay? Number four, the practice of courtesy. Now, like sense, courtesy used to be a little more common. But neither one were ever natural because that's why God made sure we have the book of Proverbs and this passage here in Romans, Romans 12, 16. But be willing to associate with the lowly or people of low position. Here's how we would summarize this statement. Be kind to all kinds of people. Did you know that in the church of the Lord Jesus, there's no room for spiritual aristocracy? Oh, what a highbrow word. Well, it basically means you're a snob. There's no room for spiritual snobbery. There's no way you can ever be part of the body of Christ and say, you know, I'm better than somebody else. And there's a certain kind of people that I don't want coming to my church. Well, that's completely wrong. And that's a sin against God because, first of all, it's his church. And it's not a country club. All right? James, the half-brother of Jesus, doesn't sugarcoat things, and instead he cuts right to the chase here, stating bluntly, here's how the practice of the principle of courtesy should be. James 2, 1 to 4. My brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, While you say to the poor man, you stand over there, you can sit here at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now James writes for us to see that it is a sin against the very character and nature of God who loves all kinds of people. You know what? The ground at the cross is level. It's a level playing field. You know, it's tempting to say that there's no such thing as VIPs in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? That's not exactly true. There are VIPs in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ because everybody in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is a very important person in the heart, in the mind of God. We're all important, we're all loved, and we're all cherished. And there's no way that we can look down our nose at somebody else and say, you're not my kind of person. Now let me just ask you this. Think about your traffic patterns this week. Just kind of think of how your week went, where you go, the people you met. Is there anybody out there that you would think, well, you know, I didn't really want that kind of person in our church. And if you think that for even just a moment, you've just sinned. Now, you know, if if I want to take a survey of the people that are in the Mason community, just go to the grocery store, right? There's all kinds of people in there. Does anything like this ever pass through your mind? It's kind of convicting, you know? But, you know, what I'm trying to say is, I honestly don't know if any of us can say that that's never happened to us. So it's probably a matter of prayer for us or to do better, so that we can do better and better each time that uh, those things come through our minds so that we don't hang on to those thoughts as long. Until eventually, and hopefully, we don't have those thoughts at all. Now historians tell us that one of the reasons the Roman Empire crumbled was because of the advent of Christianity. Because Rome was such a class-conscious society, you had plebeians, you had publicans, you had slaves... But in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was the only place that masters and slaves sat together and were on the same level. And the same is true yet today. And let me say that this as clearly as I can. There's only one person, one kind of person that's allowed to come to Eden. Ready? Only one kind of person can come to this church. Sinners. Only sinners. That's right. Now, some are safe sinners. And some are going to be safe sinners, but only one kind of person can come. Because we all need grace. We all need mercy, and we all need forgiveness. And we all need those things from Jesus. Now, if you think somebody else isn't good enough to come, to, to come or, to, or you're too good to associate with them, you're in violation of the practice of courtesy. And finally, the practice of humility. We see this in, in the healthy, care, healthy relational practices in, in, in verse 16 again. Do not be haughty or proud. Never be wise in your own sight. Don't be conceited. Don't be high-minded or think more highly of yourself than you should. And we might summarize this as take a good hard look at them in the mirror. What do you see? Laugh. Take a good hard look at the mirror and laugh. Now for some, that's going to be a lot easier to do than for others because true humility occurs when honestly you don't take yourselves too seriously. I confess. I have a habit of taking myself too seriously. I do that. A sign of good mental health is when you can laugh at yourself. Now, I'm getting a little bit better at that because I'm funny looking. 
and it gets worse all the time. But a true characteristic of humility is that you don't really take yourself too seriously. And you know that you're a sinner, and you know that you make mistakes, and you know that you have failures and flaws, and you know you're not perfect, even though we all try to hide it. Yet everybody knows it anyway. We have to be willing to understand that about ourselves and even laugh sometimes about who we are and what we do. I read about a pastor who shared this story. When Barbara Bush was the first lady, she was speaking at one of the local middle schools because they were drug-free. And the principal of the school had, invited, had been invited uh, to give the invocation that day, and he felt so honored, right? And even dressed up in a, so he dresses up in a dark suit. And it was a sunny day, and it, the gathering was outdoors. And he had sunglasses on. And there were some musicians from the church that he pastored there as they were playing. And while they were waiting for the first lady to arrive, one of them said to him, Brother D, <laughs> you look like one of those secret service agents. Sure enough. You know, he looks around, and he sees these guys in dark suits, you know, and sunglasses on, and they're kind of talking into their watch every once in a while, and they kind of assume the stance. Whatever it is, I don't know. I don't, I don't look that much. But anyway, that's kind of what he was seeing. And so since he didn't have anything else to do, he steps down in front of the platform with the other Secret Service agents, and he's just standing there with his sunglasses on, and every now and then he would just kind of act like he was talking into his watch like this, and yeah, you know, whatever. And he, he really thought that he was, had some of these people fooled. And then there's this little kid who runs up to him and with real respect says, do you know when the first lady's going to arrive? And he thought, hey, it works. This kid thinks I'm, I'm with the Secret Service. So he looks at his watch and he says, ETA for the first lady is 1320 hours. And the little kid says, thanks, Brother D. Nailed him. <laughs> little kids are good at that. They catch it right away. They know when you're not the real thing. You know, God has a real knack for humbling us, a way of teaching us that we can only be who we are. We can't be anybody else. That's why it says here, don't be conceited, don't be proud, don't be wise in your own eyes. Jesus understands that God made you a certain way. Now, some people look in the mirror and sing to themselves, how great thou art. <laughs> and that's the total opposite of humility. Do you want to get along with others? Do you want to have healthy relationships in your marriage, in your family, in your community, in your church? Practice these five principles for healthy relationships that we find here in this passage of Scripture in Romans in the Bible. The Bible is an instruction book on how we live life. It's practical if we just follow these directions, if we just do what it says. You know, Jesus lived out, and he practiced all of these principles. There is a fictional story about Simon Peter by an author that I don't recall. Jesus had been crucified, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. In this short story, Peter has a dream. And in this dream, he has a vision of Jesus hanging on the cross. And Jesus is talking to Peter, and this is what Jesus said to him, Peter, go to the man who pierced my side with a spear and tell him that you have a better way to my heart. Go to the man who put the crown of thorns on my head and tell him that I have the crown of life for him. Go to the man who lashed my back and tell him that I said but that by those stripes... They are healed. Go to the man who hammered the nails into my hands and feet and tell him that my love is a hammer that can break the hardest heart. You see, Jesus not only taught this, he loved this way. He loved his enemies. He showed kindness to all kinds of people. And the Bible said that Jesus spent time with prostitutes, publicans, and drunkards. He spent time with common people. The only kind of people that he had trouble with were religious folks the religious aristocracy that thought that they were better than everybody else. But the common people, they loved him. They loved him a lot. And when, Jesus, and when Jesus lives in you, you'll have the desire to relate to people in the same way. You don't do these things to become a Christian. You do these things because you are a Christian. You get to do them. Not long after the close of the Civil War in a fashionable downtown Richmond, Virginia Episcopal Church, the congregation was in for a shock. Because after the Sunday morning service began, an African-American man entered and sat down on the bottom level, something that had never happened before. Remember, this is Civil War time. There was a buzz of discussion that went through the congregation. And when it came time in the service for the worshipers to come to the altar and kneel and receive communion, the African-American man was the first one to walk forward and kneel at the altar to receive communion. Once again, there was a buzz, there was a discussion, and shocked silence spread throughout the entire congregation, throughout the gathering. Even the rector didn't know what to do. And very soon, an esteemed and respected layman 
in that Richmond, Virginia church got up and he walked down to the front and knelt down right beside the African-American man to receive communion right there beside him. And when he did that, the rest of the congregation came to receive communion along with their African-American brother. That esteemed layman who broke the ice for the rest of the congregation was none other than General Robert E. Lee, a committed Christian who not only loved Jesus, but loved all of God's creatures. Now there is one spot at the head of God's communion table, and it's reserved for Jesus. The rest of us are all on equal footing. We're all broken sinners in desperate need of a Savior. Jesus is our example. He practiced these principles in his life. Now may he give us the strength and the courage and the ability to go and do the same. This time, let's all bow our heads and have a short word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, these things are difficult for us. It goes against human nature by and large. But I pray that if there are those gathered here today in this room who are having trouble with some relationships or just struggling with relationships, that we begin to practice these healthy relationship principles. And then through the power of Jesus, released by the Holy Spirit, I pray that we would begin to relate to people exactly the way you relate to people. Lord, help us to be a shining example of your life and your love. Help us to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ as we leave this place. Help us to live Jesus before others so that they know him and they see him. Help us to practice good, healthy relationship practices. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's see, was there anything else that you had on here? I think Kim told me there wasn't. So at this time, you are all dismissed, and we'll see you at the party and in the worship celebration next Sunday. Thanks for being here, everybody.